So this is Resurrection Sunday, amen? It's Easter, but you know what? As, as a Bible-believing faith church, I mean, oh, every Sunday for us is Resurrection Sunday, amen? We're excited all the time that he is risen from the grave. But this morning is something that all over the world, there are people that sometimes never attend church, that attends church on Sunday. There are people that are filling churches all over this province right now to hear the gospel message. There are school assemblies that take place that don't take place generally to do with Christianity, but on Easter, they get taught the resurrection. They get taught that it's Easter, and this is why we celebrate it. It is Easter, and there's nothing that can take away what Christ has done. Amen? So we're going to go into the Word this morning and believe for God to speak to us because we don't want to go into the word and not be spoken to. Amen? We want to hear what he says. So I pray that this message is going to spark life in the hearts of the people here this morning. Father, I thank you for your, your blood that was shed. Thank you for paying the price for me. Thank you for covering, God, our sin. Thank you for setting us free. And God, I pray this morning, God, that I'm nothing without you, and I just want your truth to go forward. God, I'm just an instrument, God. I pray that you would, you would be the one who, who works through me. And God, I pray that every word that is spoken would not just be words that can go into one ear and out the other or just touch the intellect of people's minds, but God, I pray that there will be anointed words that will pierce the hearts of your people. So God, that it would be something that they would live with, God, walk with, God, and live in. And I just believe for that right now. Take your servant, God, and I pray for your anointing. Your anointing will be upon this message today. Come against every work of the enemy in every way he would try to interfere, every way he would try to stop or hinder people from receiving, God, what you want to say. And I thank you right now. He is a defeated foe in Jesus' name. He is defeated, and we have victory through the cross and through the blood in Jesus' name. So, God, I pray this morning that you would do exactly what you want to do and how you want to do it in this house. In the mighty name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen, amen. amen. Well, there was a man who left for Chicago on vacation or lived in Chicago and he left for vacation and went to Florida. We just got some, uh, somebody here today who just got back from Florida from 32 degrees back to this. Amen. And we're going to pray for joy. Amen for you. But he went on vacation to Florida. His wife was on a business trip, and she was planning on meeting him the next day. When he reached the hotel, he decided to send her a quick love note, just a note to say, hey. So he emailed her, and unable to find the scrap piece of paper in which he had written her email address, he did his best to type it from memory. How many people have been there? Unfortunately, he missed one letter, and his note was directed instead to an elderly preacher's wife whose husband had passed away only the day before. When the grieving widow checked her email, she took one look at the monitor, let out a piercing scream, and she fell dead to the floor. At the sound, her family rushed into the room and saw the note on the screen which read, Dearest wife, just got checked in. Everything prepared for your arrival tomorrow, your loving husband. P.S., Sure is hot down here. <laughs> How many know if you got an email like that, <laughs> you would quite feel the same? I mean, that preacher's wife <laughs> probably prayed before she hit the floor. <laughs> what could be more powerful than news from the other side? What could be more powerful than a word that is spoken from somebody who's gone from this life to the next and is able to come and say, hey, I've been there. I've seen the streets of gold. I've seen the jasper walls. I've seen where there's no sorrow, where there's no pain, where there is no disease, no sickness. What could be better than a word from over there? We've all heard of the man named Harry Houdini. He was an escape artist. And he was really good. He specialized in escaping. And it was said that he would even laugh at locks, 
You would sneer at chains. They said he had a flexibility of a heel, and he had the lives of a cat. They did all kinds of things to incarcerate him and, and get him stuck, but they would seal him in coffins and he would escape. They would rivet him in a boiler and he escaped. They sold him up in canvas bags and he escaped. They locked him in a milk can, a thing that would have delivered milk, and he escaped. They sealed him in a beer barrel and he escaped. They put him in a maximum security prison and somehow he escaped. He got out. But then in October 1926, death laid his hands on Harry Houdini and put him in a grave. And he is yet to escape. As a matter of fact, he told his wife, before he died, he said to his wife, he said, wife, listen to me. <laughs> and then he died. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's not what happened. But he said to his wife before he died, he said, he said this, if there's any way out, he said, I will find it. And he said, when I will do it, it will be on our anniversary. So for 10 years, his wife would light a candle over his portrait and would wait and wait and wait. After 10 years of past, she stopped waiting because he didn't show up. Death is something that none of us can escape. There is a day coming for every person who walks the face of this planet, every person who takes their first breath. There will be a day that will come when they will take their last breath. All of us, whether we try to keep in shape and we try to work out and we try to keep our hair dyed or we try to keep our hair, whatever it may be, the day is coming when all of us are going to be silvery gray if we reach that point and we will be the ones that will be taking our last breath to go from this life to eternity. It comes for all. And the fact is, as much as we want to try to fight death and try to escape death and try to stay away from death, it will happen to this body. So I want to take you on a little journey in Scripture. We're going to start in John chapter 11, and this is a very popular, popular chapter. And I want to talk to you about I am the resurrection. I am the resurrection. In chapter 11, we start off, I'm not going to read all this for the sake of time, but I will read portions of, of this chapter. But we're talking about Lazarus. And how many people know Lazarus and what happened to him? And you know the story. You've read the story. But we want to dive deep into the story so we get a, a, a greater understanding of what this story is telling us. And I don't know if you realize that in Scripture you read and you read. But if you read and you ask the Holy Spirit to reveal, the Holy Spirit reveals and brings truth from Scripture that you never ever knew were there. I love it when you buy a new vehicle. I'm a manual person. I like reading manuals. I know it's weird. It's, it's, most men are like, oh, I'll fix it. I don't know what to do. I'm like, no, let me read. I want to know how this works because I understand that the manual that God gives us works. Amen? The Bible works. So I, I, I want to find something out. And you ever had those moments where you had a vehicle and you drove it for years and you never ever bothered to read, read the manual and all of a sudden you found out that vehicle did something you didn't know it did? You're like, I didn't know it did that. I've gotten in vehicles with people and I like cars. So I've gotten in vehicles. I said, oh, yeah, you just do this. And boom, what? I've been driving this car all this time and I never knew that. We, we have a vehicle where we have two different settings in our vehicle. You push one setting and it, it goes, and the seat goes all back into position that you like. So if she's driving the vehicle, she could push the button and, and it gets, and you all, up, I, if I try to sit in there, I'm like stuck in the, in the, sometimes I've pushed it just for fun while I'm waiting for her in the mall somewhere. And I was like, I'm like, how do you drive like this? And I'll push my button, and I'm like, yeah, back in my comfort state. But there are people that are probably driving a vehicle just like that vehicle that wonder, what are these buttons for? And unless they try to figure it out, Matt, you could probably speak to that. I'm sure Corey could too, of people that are trying to figure things out. Well, there's so much truth in Scripture, and if we don't take the time to read it, to study it, the Bible says, study to show thee yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of the truth. If we don't study it, we're just going to read it and walk on. But when you study something, when you read something, when you meditate on something, you say, God, reveal. All of a sudden, truths come alive, and you walk those truths out in your life, and life is different than you ever knew it could be. It's a lot more comfortable driving the vehicle of life because you understood how it worked. 
So in this chapter, we're talking about Lazarus. And in verse 6, Therefore, even when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he still stayed two days longer in the same place where he was. Then after the, that interval, he said to his disciples, let's go back again to Judea. And his disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews only recently in, were intending on trying to stone you. They were trying to kill you. And you're thinking of going back there again? And Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in a day? Anyone who walks about in the daytime does not stumble because he sees by the light of this world. Jesus was seeing something by the light. Amen? He knew, I I'm going. But if anyone walks about in the night, he does stumble. But there is no light in him. The light is lacking in him. He said these things, and then he added, Our friend Lazarus is at rest and sleeping. But I'm going there that I may awaken him out of sleep. I got to try to find how many places I could stop here because of time. Because I know some people might have a turkey cooking and a roast that might be burning. But I, I, I got to pause here for a minute. He said, I must go there and awaken them out of sleep. Let me tell you, there is something that happens to a church when Jesus passes by and sees some faith that is in operation. He comes and he wakes up a people. And see, there are a lot of dead sleeping churches in the world where you walk in and you sit and you listen to some message read off a piece of paper and you sing this song, sing this song, go through these rituals and these ceremonies and go home and you just put in your religious time for the week. But there is something else to be said about a body of people who decide to get a hold of some truth and say, I'm going to walk it out and live it out in my life. A church that is awake. A church where there's life. Life. He said, I must awake him. The disciples answered, Lord, if he is sleeping, he will recover. However, Jesus had spoken of death, but they thought he was referring to falling into a refreshing natural sleep. See, the enemy wants us to think we're falling into a nice restful sleep. We're just becoming like other churches. We just got nice comfortable seats. We, we, we got the, the building. We got all the stuff. We got all the instruments. We got everything that makes it easy, and it's just so nice, and we're relaxed, and it's wonderful. And we go, and we got our messages that are right down to the right time our songs at the right time we got our time limit we got set and then it's all good refreshing I want beyond a refreshing sleep I want resurrection power I want a revived church not a church that tries to act like the church but the church who is the church amen revival in the church and God wants to wake us up so then Jesus told them plainly Lazarus is dead do you know sometimes the church needs to be told, hey, you're just plain old dead. People need to be told sometimes you're just dead. I don't know. How gonna... You're just dead. You need some life. How many know when life is in people, they go back, listen, I know it's hard. I know I don't know what I'm going to do. I know it feels like I'm out for the count and, and I, I don't know how to make it, but there's some life inside of me and I'm going to keep going anyway because it don't matter what I see, what I feel, what I hear. I got something on the inside that stands up. Um, I got to stop because I, I, I love Resurrection Sunday. They thought he was just in a refreshing sleep. He said, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, he said, I'm glad that I was not there. It will help you to believe, to trust, and to rely on me. However, let's go. Let's go. Let's go to him. Verse 16, then Thomas, who was called the twin. You ever get those people who just don't know what they're talking about? People trying to sound all religious. Thomas, who was called a twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us go too, that we may be killed along with him. They're not trusting Jesus. Let's just go die. No. They're walking with the light. They're walking with the Messiah. So when Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus has been already in the tomb for four days days. Everybody say four days. How many know traveling wasn't like it is today? It was two days he waited before he go and then he went and then when he got there, four days Lazarus was in the grave. 
Bethany was near Jerusalem, only about two miles away, and a considerable number of the Jews had gone out to see Martha and to console them concerning their brother, to console them. How many know there's too many consolers and not enough resurrectors? There's all kinds of people that can pat you on the back, but it takes some people to love you enough to speak truth. And while they're patting you on the back, they say, hey, it's time to shake yourself. It's time to step up, stand up, trust in him who is able. See, I, I, I believe it's nice to console. I'm a pastor. Sometimes I go in and there's no words. I've sat with people and I've just cried with them. There's times I've gone in and I've just been there in a the moment. And you know, there's not no word that I can say. I can just be here. So I know what it is to console. But there are moments when consoling is not enough. I want resurrection power. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, and Mary remained sitting in the house. Martha then said to Jesus, Master, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. Church, let me ask you, is he here? Only three people believe he's here. Make no wonder. Praise Jesus. No. Is he here? Yes, he's here. He doesn't take a break. He doesn't sleep. He doesn't slumber. He is alive and he is well. He is here. And in this situation, she's looking at it and seeing it from the natural perspective. And she's thinking, if Jesus had been here, he could have done something. And sometimes we think if Jesus didn't show up when we thought he should have showed up in our situation, then it's over. And if only Jesus showed up when I thought he should show up, it would have been okay. How many know he don't always show up when you think he should? Sometimes we're waiting for him to show up, so then all the glory goes to the bank. If I could just get approved. Sometimes we're waiting for him to show up in the midst of our natural abilities that we put into play to try to work something out. I mean, no, I'd rather the supernatural any day than the natural. The natural gives man glory. The supernatural gives God glory. And there's too many people that are looking for glory in themselves. Look what I did. Look what I can do. Look at what I've done. Look at my dance. There's only so much that you can do, but he can do anything. All things are possible to them who believe. Master, if you've been here, it's never too late. And even now, I know, see, she, this is Martha speaking faith. How many know it's important to speak faith? Martha speaks faith here, and he, even now, I know that wherever you ask from God, he will grant you. Jesus said to her, your brother shall rise again. Jesus said, your brother shall rise again. Now she's just saying, whatever you ask will happen. And Jesus said, your brother shall rise again. And Martha replies, I know he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am myself. The resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in, adheres to, trust in, relies on me, although he may die, yet shall he live. And whoever continues to live and believe in, has faith and cleaves to, relies on me, shall never actually die at all. Do you believe this? Do you believe this, church? Do you know that this body is getting older? I'm 35. I'm still young. But I'm getting older. Some of you are double that probably here today. It's, it's okay to get older. But there's a day coming when this body, this mortal, will put on immortality. There's a day coming when I'll take the last breath in this body, but I'll take the first breath in glory. Amen? It is so. He said here, do you believe? Do you believe this? So you got Martha trying to speak some faith here, and you got Jesus keeping saying, I am the resurrection. She said to him, yes, Lord, I have believed. I do believe that you are Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, the Son of God, even he who was to come into the world. It is for your coming that the world has awaited. 
After she had said this, she went back in and called her sister Mary privately, whispering to her, the teacher is close at hand, and he is asking for you. When she heard this, she sprang up quickly and went to him. When she heard this, she sprang up quickly and went to them. When she had heard this, she sprang up quickly and she ran to him. There are people sitting in the churches all across this nation that are hearing life-giving words, but we sit in our despair. When she heard this, hope was whispering. When she heard this, answers were on the way. And she sprang up. What do you need to hear before you spring up to meet him? What do you need to hear before you jump at the opportunity to believe? What is it that we are waiting for as believers, as the church? As Christians. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still in the same spot where Martha had met him. He must have stopped and rested. And when the Jews were sitting with her in the house, consoling her, saw how hastily Mary had risen and gone out. They followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to pour out her grief. Hmm. Going to go to the tomb. Pour out her grief. Hope. It's over. It's done. No, she wasn't going to the tomb. She was going to the resurrector. She was going to the one who was able. So they followed her to console her. And when Mary came to the place where Jesus was and saw him, she dropped down at his feet saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would have not died. If you had been here. Church, there are situations in your life that you still look back on and you say, if God had only, if I had only, if I had just listened, if I had just heard, if I, if, 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 and we get stuck in these moments. They're stuck. They're looking at what's happened. They're looking at the fact that Lazarus is in the grave. They're looking at the fact it's been four days. They're looking at the fact it seems to be over, but they're sitting at the feet of the one who can do anything. The same I am who was in the burning bush. The same I am who said light be. The same I am standing right there. I am the resurrection. My brother wouldn't have died. Jesus saw her sobbing, and the Jews came with her also sobbing. And he was deeply moved in his spirit and troubled. He chafed in spirit and sighed with disturbed, and was disturbed. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. The shortest verse in all the Bible. Jesus wept. You want a memory verse? Right there. Jesus wept. The Jews said, see how tenderly he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened blind man's eyes have repented this man from dying? How many know there's doubt everywhere in the air? There's a recognition that Jesus is there. There's a recognition that he had seen blind eyes open. There's a recognition that there have been miracles done at the works of Christ. But even here, people are around him, and he is surrounded at, at, with doubt. Could it be that when Jesus was weeping, he wasn't weeping over the fact that Lazarus was dead? I would have ventured to say, and my belief is that he was weeping at the doubt and the unbelief that was clouding him when he's about to walk in and see something miraculous happen. And some of us weep in our life because we are fighting through the doubt and the unbelief of people around us when inside you know there's something that wants to stand up and be strong in Christ. Resurrection power. Jesus wept. Look how tenderly he loved him. But some said he could not open blind eyes. Could he have not prevented it? This man from dying, he opened blind eyes. Could he not have prevented this man from dying? They're still stuck in the natural. Church, it is so easy to live in this world and get stuck in the natural. It's natural to worry. It's natural to feel this way. It's natural. Natural. 
supernatural. That in the midst of what others would fall apart at, we stand strong in because our faith is in him. Now Jesus again sighing repeatedly and deeply disquieted approached the tomb. It was a cave, a hole in a rock, a boulder laid against it, the entrance to it closed. And Jesus said, take away the stone. Jesus said, I mean, when Jesus says something, just be quiet. How often did Jesus speak to us and the first thing comes is whatever we think? I we play a game sometimes with some of the youth and I, I play the game where I say a word and you say the first word that comes to you. I mean, it was dangerous in life to say the first thing that comes to your mind. <laughs> because I don't know about you, my mind is still in the renewing process. And I know a lot of people that got foot and mouth disease. <laughs> Amen? You know what I'm talking about because we've all struggled with this disease at some point in our life where, where, where we, we, we know we shouldn't say something, but it's just bubbling on the inside of us. And all of a sudden, and once it's out, can't get it back. So as soon as Jesus said, take away the soul, Martha at that moment should have said, Whoo, glory, there's a miracle about to happen. She just was told by Jesus, I am the resurrection and life. If you believe, man, you think she would have been just standing back and say, move the stone, boys. Jesus is here. Ooh, my brother coming out of the, no. The first thing comes to her mind, the sister of the dead man exclaimed, but Lord, by this time he's decaying and he's stinking and throws off an offensive order for he has been dead four days. You think Jesus was sighing before this? <sighs> Martha, Martha, Martha. How many times does he have to fight the first thing that comes to our mind when he's about to break through and do a miracle in your life. See, he's not withholding from you. He's fighting through the doubt and the unbelief of your mind. He's fighting through all the attacks that are on your head and on your heart that you're, you're saying, I can't see how this can work. But, but, the, but he's been dead for four days. But she said that she didn't want anything else to do with me. But he said he didn't want anything else to do with me. Our marriage seems to be over. The, it seems that the doctors say there's no more hope for me. But, 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 but. And God is pushing through the doubt and on the belief to try to work a miracle in your life. Let me in with the resurrection power. And right here, doubt is surrounded him. Jewish people that wanted to stone him. Are looking, watching. What's going to happen here? And in the midst of all of this, Jesus is still fighting through it. He might have been sighing a little bit. He might have had some holy indignation of frustration within his heart saying, what are they doing? But he was fighting through it, and he still says, pull the stone away. And Jesus said to her, did I not tell you, church, did he not tell us did he not tell you? Did he not say a few words? Some people have not read this book because it's so thick of a book. How can I get through that book? But he told us a lot of things in this book. And if you read the B-I-B-L-E, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God. The B-I-B-L-E. It's the book that transforms life. It's the book they tried to burn. It's the book that kings have said, we got to do away with this because it's causing too much trouble in our kingdom. It's the book that caused people to be thrown to the lions while people watched as they were ripped apart. It's the book that caused people to be stoned and shot and sold in half. This book called the Bible. And as much as they tried to get rid of it, it is still the number one selling book in the world. It is still the book, the first book that was ever printed on a printing press. It's the book that is still changing lives. Have he not told us some things from this book? He told us a lot. He said, did I not tell you and promise you 
that if you will believe and rely on me, you will see the glory of God. So they took away the stone. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. Yes, I know you always hear and listen to me, but I have said this on the account for them that, and the benefit of them that are standing around me so that they may, may believe that you did send me and that you have made me your messenger. When he said this, he shouted. <laughs> Pastor, you're shouting a bit too much to the out today. Mark, turn that mic down for goodness sake. We're all going to go home with a headache. Well, take some ibuprofen. <laughs> Jesus. He stood in front of a grave where a man had been dead for four days. He stinketh by now. The stone has been rolled back and he stands at the tomb. And he said a few words just for people in around him because he knew who he was. And he shouted, Lazarus, come forth. People stood by. What's this crazy guy doing? Jesus, he stinks. Jews are thinking, should we get the rocks ready now? Doubt all around him. Garbage all around him. Frustration. But in the midst of it all, resurrection power was at work through the man named Jesus. And out from the grave came a man bound in grave clothes. And Jesus said, unwrap him and set him free. See, there are a lot of people that have come out of the grave of death because death has tried to keep you down. There are some people in here that have been through stuff that if you got up here to tell your story today, people's eyes would bulge out of their head because they wouldn't believe that you've been through the things you've been through. But I promise you something, that once you get out of the grave of death, there's more than just walking around in grave clothes and saying, I was dead, but now it's a shout that you got now that came from the shout that God gave you to say, you are free. I'm free. Glory to God, walking in it, living in it. Whew, I was dead, but now I am free. And listen, I'm not ministering out of my hurt. I'm ministering out of my healing. I'm telling people who Jesus is. I'm telling him what he's done for me. And when the devil comes back in like a flood, I got scripture that tells me that he will raise up a standard against him. I got scripture that tells me if he be for me, who can be against me? I got scripture that tells me if a thousand fall at my right hand and ten thousand at my left, no harm should come unto me. I got scripture that tells me I'm more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. I got scripture that tells me that by him I can run through a troop. I can leap over a wall. I got scripture that tells me it's okay. I believe it. He said something. In the midst of it, Lazarus comes forth. I want to take you a little bit farther here today. A little bit farther. Four days, four days he was in that grave. Could it be that when Jesus was in that moment of weeping, that he was looking beyond Lazarus in the grave, that he was looking beyond the doubters that were around him, and he was looking forward into time when he would be in the Garden of Gethsemane on his face before God and saying, Father, if there be any other way, let this cup pass from me. And the weeping that was coming from him in that moment was still yet the weeping that he endured and he felt in that garden when he comes out from weeping and saying, God, if there be another way, let this cup from pass from me. And he finds his closest disciples Could it be that when he wept that day and he was still looking ahead and he was seeing the moment when Judas would walk up to him and tell the people is that the one that I kiss is the one that, that, that it is. And he walks up to Jesus and with a kiss of betrayal, he kisses Jesus on the cheek and steps back while the soldiers crowd in to arrest him. Let, let me just stop for a moment and give you this because I like this part and I can't get away from it. I know we're running out of time, but that's okay. When they came to 
arrest Jesus. I am the resurrection was the one who they he said to them when they said, we look for Jesus who is called Christ. He spoke the words, I am. And with the words, I am the resurrection power that was all over him. The soldiers went flat down to the ground. Could it be that while he was weeping, while he was in tears, while he was grieved, the scripture says, that he was looking forward in time and seeing the disciples scatter when the chains are put on him and that he's dragged away. While all the disciples fled, what do we do now? Peter, who said, I would not deny him, would it be that Jesus wept because he looked ahead in time and he could see Peter and deny him three times before the rooster crows? And then the day comes. Pilate takes him out. He stood before the crowd. Because I, I don't have time to tell you all about it, but if you read the next so many verses in the book of John chapter 11, it talks about the Jewish people at that moment in time who left after just seeing a miracle and they weren't caught up with the miracle and the resurrection power. They were caught up the fact of that they were going to lose their power. And how many people in life today are caught up with losing their power? Let me tell you, I give all power that I have, which is very, very little, to God. Because he is the one who ignites us with power from another realm. We do want to hold on. We're the keepers of the law. We're the keepers of the Old Testament Torah. We're the keepers of the Ten Commandments. We're the keeper of the 653 laws. We're the keeper of keeping stuff in order. We're the ones who dress the part. We sit in these seats while we let the poor sit in the back. We're the ones who watch to see what is being given. We're, we're the ones that, that are in power. And these very people bring them in these stands before the crowd. And Caiaphas leads this. And he says, give us Barabbas. Who is Barabbas? For those who don't know, Barabbas was a notorious criminal. He was a murderer. He was a thief. He was well known in the community. Nobody wanted him around. They were happy he was in prison. They were happy that he didn't, they, he wasn't going to bother them anymore. And they look up and they see this Barabbas standing next to Pilate. And they look to the right and they see standing next to Pilate Jesus, who is called the Christ, who rose Lazarus from the dead, who opened blinded eyes, who fed the hungry, who done work after work after work. And they stand there blinded. And he said, let his blood be upon us and upon our children's children. They didn't know how prophetic the word that they were speaking at that moment in time was. But it was. Let Barabbas go and crucify Jesus. I'm going somewhere with this. Just bear with me. And see... The preaching of the cross is foolishness to people that are lost. I've got a little warning word for people here today. If you're here and the preaching of the cross is foolishness to you and you don't know if you believe this, you're in serious trouble. You're lost. Because the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who are lost, but it is salvation. It's life to those who believe. So, they take Jesus, he is nailed to the cross, he is crucified. Blood streams down Calvary's hill. We know what Easter is about. We know that he is hanging there and that he gives up his ghost, scripture says. He says the words, it is finished, and he takes his last breath. Imagine, you think there was doubt? When Lazarus was in the grave, you think there was doubt? When Jesus was walking, healthy, living, breathing, 
You think there was doubt when they saw that Lazarus was stinking? What do you think they saw when they saw a man that was beaten, hardly recognizable, that he was beaten to such a point that people didn't know he was a man, where his back was literally ripped and torn apart, and they took down this murdered, beaten back Savior, Messiah. And they lay him in a grave. Joseph of Arimathea, a rich man. He was almost like an undercover disciple. He'd be careful because he didn't want to be put to death during the time of everything was happening. He shows up and he says, give me his body. And that's to fulfill the prophecy that he would die a poor man's death, but he would have a rich man's burial. And they took Jesus and they laid him in the grave of Joseph of Arimathea. A stone is rolled in front of it. There is a seal that is put on it. That seal was not just any seal. It was a Roman seal. The seal meant this, that if you tamper with it, if you mess with it, if you do anything with it, it is punishable by death. You will be on the cross yourself. They had soldiers, not just any soldiers, but they had soldiers posted next to it. Don't let anybody come near this. You think there was doubt when Lazarus was in the grave? Now, the Messiah, the one they placed their hope in, the one that they were believing was going to establish his kingdom upon this earth, the one they were believing that was going to be their new king, the one that they just watched as he come in on a donkey and people laid down palm trees and coats and said, ah, Hosanna. This Jesus is dead. Dead. Three days pass. The disciples have met in a room. They're hiding. Could you imagine the meeting that's taken place? They're sitting there, and as they're talking, what, what do we do now? Lost. Alone know what to do it's over have you ever found yourself in those moments sitting with your husband or your wife or sitting with your children or sitting with the doctor or or sitting with the bank or sitting with your head in your hands and tears dripping from your cheeks and saying what do I do now it's over and then Matthew chapter 27 this is resurrection Sunday See, I like to see what he did for me on the cross, but don't let me ever get stuck on the cross. There are too many people who got Jesus hanging up on the cross still outside their churches. Jesus nailed and pierced to the cross. It's good to see that, but I thank God that when I see the cross that we got here right now, it is an empty cross because he ain't on it anymore. He went there to accomplish a purpose, and he accomplished the purpose. This is where we are right now. Disciples are in a room. Three days have passed. Finally, Mary, Martha goes out, going to go to his body. She gets there. And when she looks, the stone is rolled back. The Roman seal is broken. The soldiers have probably gone in some deep sleep. They're out like a light. And all of a sudden, she's thinking, what is happening? She runs back. What do we do? He's gone. His body's not there. Now you think the disciples would clue in after all the times that Jesus has said to them, I'm going to die and on the third day I'm going to rise, I'm going to go, but I'm going to come back. You know, don't worry, I won't leave you comfortless. I mean, he told them, told them, and told them, and told them, and told them, and then he told them some more, but yet they're still sitting there and they're doubting under unbelief, wondering what are we going to do? See, you think that God had to extend his might and his strength to raise Lazarus from the dead? You got all of humanity. All of humanity, all of hell rejoicing, all of the darkness just all of a sudden clouded in over. And now they go back and he appears and he says to Martha, says to Mary, why, why are you crying? What are you, what are you crying for? She goes back and tells the disciples, he's alive. Then he walks in through the wall of the room, probably a room that they had rented to try to get together and have some board meeting to figure out what they're going to do. Hey, guys. 
Could you imagine the moment for those disciples right there and then when they see Jesus and the Bible says he breathed life into them of the Holy Spirit. There was new life that came because of what he had done. Let me tell you, you think it was hard to raise Lazarus from the dead. Right now, God, the Bible says he extended his mighty arm, Jesus, and he came to make a difference in the life and all of humanity is doubting. Let me tell you, he had to flex his mighty arm for this miracle because there was no faith on the scene. There was no one believing on the scene, but it was God Almighty who said, oh, look out. It ain't over yet. Now, how do all this connect with us today? Your marriage ain't over yet. You just heard it gets better. Your body ain't dead yet. That loved one you're believing for, he ain't in the grave yet. That loved one who's not serving Jesus, it ain't over for them yet. Because he's alive. He's alive. And the same power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead quickens this mortal body. And no matter what you feel, no matter what you see, no matter how much doubt is on the scene, no matter how many people tell you it is over, there's got to be still somebody left within the church that still believes that he is the resurrected Savior and he is still able. There's still got to be some shouts left in the church to say, hey, money, come forth. Health, come forth. Children, come forth. There's still got to be some shouting left in the church. It's still got to be some believers in the church because now he's alive. What's different about Christianity than any other religion? Her God came to this earth in the form of a man, died for his people. What other king leaves his throne? to die for his people. And then he rose. He's alive, church. He's alive. He's alive. See, there's lots of people who think all kinds of things. A Sunday school teacher asked her students in her Sunday school room, what's Easter all about? She got answers about chocolate. She got answers about, about, about you know, uh, Easter bunny. They got answers about, you know, a bunny trail. They got answers about all kinds of things. They get answers like we got the other night that it's the day Jesus was born. What is Easter all about? One little girl pipes up and she said, Jesus arose from the tomb. And the teacher asked, and what does that mean for us? She said, I don't know. He comes out of the tomb and he looks for a bit and he goes back in for six weeks if his shadow's not there. How many times do we have in the church people not understanding what resurrection means? How many times in the church do we have people here, yes, resurrection power, yes, resurrection power, but then when circumstances of life hits us like a ton of bricks and we feel like giving up, we think this is it, it's over. We don't know about the resurrection power, that there's still a shout on the inside of us that could put our feet down, solid upon a rock and say, hey, it ain't over for me yet. There needs to be some fight left within the church because the fight I fight is not like Paul said. He said, I don't fight as one who beateth the air. He's determined that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, Philippians chapter 3. And the fellowship of his sufferings, that I may know him. See, it's not about knowing your church. It's not about knowing your pastor. It's not about knowing some special person. It's about knowing capital H, him. It's about knowing the Savior. It's about knowing the resurrection power. Listen, Houdini, he couldn't get out of the grave. Listen, there's nobody else that's come back and lived and walked the earth and claimed to be who he claimed to be, but he did. He appeared before the disciples. He appeared before Mary. He appeared before the 500. Then he ascended, and he said, listen, I am coming back. Day is coming. See, I don't know about you. I don't want to be one of those people to walk through this life. Well, by what we expect, 
Satan's the god of this world. What we expect. Can't have everything. What we expect. You know, suffering for Jesus. Want to know him in a fellowship of his sufferings. I don't want to suffer in my sufferings if he already suffered for me. The fellowship of his suffering. See, in his suffering is this. When the enemy tries to beat up on me and tell me I'm not good enough, tell me I'm a mess, and tell me I'm not able to do what he's, I'm supposed to do, and tell me that I'm a bad person, I'm this and that. I don't want to suffer in that. I want to step up and say, cross is empty. Tomb is empty. And he's at the right hand of God right now praying for me. It ain't over for me yet. I'm sorry. Back up. It ain't over. I, I claim to be one of the happiest people on the face of the planet. The Bible says a man have joy by the answer of his mouth. How you doing? I'm doing. How you doing? Joy, I'm speakable and full of glory. How you doing? I'm full of the Holy Ghost. How you doing? Man, I'm just loving life. How you doing? I'm just excited about what's next. Why? Because I know that if I go out of this life fight and take my last breath, it's <laughs> Man, oh man, can you just, just picture that? It's just like, well, yes, I love Jesus. That's what it's going to be like. And you think that what we go through in this life really matters when you take your last breath and you walk over there and it's like, whoa. Man, bring it on. He is the resurrection. He is the life. And I don't want to miss it. I'm going to ask the worship team to come. John chapter 16, verse 33. I have told you these things so that you might have perfect peace and confidence in the world. No. You might have perfect peace and confidence because in the world you will have tribulations and trouble and distress and frustration. Let me tell you this, church. There are going to be some things that are going to hit you and knock the wind out of you. There are some things that are going to hit you, and if you all you got is a relationship with God that comes from the intellect of your mind and what you can perceive and comprehend, then you are missing what it really means to know to have resurrection power operating in your life. If all you got is this, yes, I believe, I see this, and I understand this, and, and I, no, 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 because sometimes life is going to hit you so hard <laughs> that you don't know how you're going to get up again. Yes, I believe... <laughs> Never rains, but it pours. Life is going to hit you so hard that you're going to feel like not even believing. Life is going to hit you so hard that you're not even going to be able to see clearly through the mess you're in. That's why you got to have something more to stand on than what you think that you can intellectually understand in this little mind, you little mind of ours. I'm talking about. The resurrection power, his spirit bears witness with my spirit that I am a child of God. That to as many as would believe him, to them he gave the power to become children of God. To as many as would believe on his name. See, when life hits you like that, I want to be able to say, the world will have tribulation, trials, distress, and frustration. But be of good cheer. Take courage, be confident, certain, undaunted. For I have overcome the world. I have deprived it of power to harm you and have conquered it for you. For I have overcome the world. Church, can we stand together? The moment that we're in right now is a moment that you need to step from the natural to the supernatural. The moment that you're in right now is the moment that you got to step from all the doubt and the unbelief that says, hey, Lazarus can't come out of that grave. He's been dead for days. I've been stubborn, struggling with this for days. I've been fighting through this for days. The moment with the issue of blood for 12 years. 12 years. Pushed through. Pushed through. If I could just touch the hem of his garment she pushed through 
What is it today? You got to push through. Some of you got to shout today. Some of you got to shout what you believe. Get past and beyond what you feel. Shout what you believe. Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. That name that is above every name. That God, you would go on beyond all the doubt, the frustration, the hurt, the pain, the lies, the deceit. And that God, as you continue to fight through that, God, I pray that we would speak words that will push right on through, to grab a hold, to grab a hold of the truth that sets us free, that he, the I am, the resurrection and the life. What do you need resurrected today? What do you need resurrected today in your life? As we sing this song, I want us to step out of I want us to step out of, I raise my hand because it's just what we do. I want you to step out of, we close our eyes because it's just what we do. I want you to step out of, of this is how we do church. I want you to step out of all those things and the formalities of what church to us have become. And I want you to step into this place of where, God, I'm going to worship. I'm going to worship. I'm going to praise you. The resurrection power of Jesus Christ. Let's worship him. Lead us in. Who breaks? Who breaks the power That's right. of sin and darkness? There's so much. The king above. Oh, Jesus. Come on, church. Who shakes this whole earth with holy thunder? Who leaves his presence in all of wonder? The King of glory, the King above all. This is amazing grace. This is a failing.